-hmm. And I love it because it means the reader can know something before the characters. Mm -hmm. And so you can add that extra layer of fun for the reader. To, it's almost like when you're watching a, a play and you want to scream, don't do it, because you can <laughs> see somebody behind somebody, you know, with a knife. It's that kind of, you know, reader knowledge. Welcome to our latest book reporter talks to interview where we're going to be talking to Gilly McMillan and we're going to be talking about her latest novel, The Manor House, which is a book reporter bets on selection. Now, our reviewer, Ray Palin, had this to say about it. I read well over 100 thrillers each year and pretty much can see any plot twist coming. That was not the case with The Manor House. As the first twist McMillan plants is a whopper and the second one takes the tale into uncharted territory. And with that introduction, welcome, Gilly. So nice to have you here. Thank you very much, Carol. Let's lovely start to talking. Back. I know this is our third run, our third run, you know? Okay, let's start with you telling us about the Manor House. I'll put it on so you. The, on me. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so the Manor House is a book about a young couple called Tom and Nicole, and they are high school sweethearts, uh, very much in love still. And they're very, very normal, regular people, um, in as much as anybody's regular, but they are, and they're building a life together. And one day they win the lottery and they win 10 million pounds, which I think is about 18 million US dollars, something like that. Um, so obviously it's life changing and they do what I think um, a lot of us would do, which is they get a real estate upgrade and they build this incredible glass barn on a very beautiful peninsula on a piece of land overlooking a river between England and Wales and it's a gorgeous place very isolated there's only one other property nearby which is called the manor house which is where the title of the book comes from and the book opens with Nicole coming home uh, one morning to their new home and she walks in and importantly it's a smart home her husband Tom has packed this house full of smart features and there's music blaring and this shouldn't happen because the music should follow you from room to room as you walk through the house. Um, so she's confused. She calls for him. She, he can't hear her. The music's too loud. She hunts through the house. Um, and she's, you know, she's touchy. She's tutting. She's putting away his dirty coffee. She's straightening the bed. He hasn't done any jobs. And eventually she finds herself on the balcony outside their bedroom. And from there, she looks down to their swimming pool and she sees him floating in it upside down and he's dead. And the story kicks off from there. It's a kind of, is he murdered? If so, who did it? Basically what's happened and what's the manor house got to do with it? Yeah, what's the manor house got to do? Now remember he's dead on like by page five, I think it is, yep. like we're not that far in. Yeah. yeah. It's not like five, guys, you don't have to read long to figure out that this is what's going on. I love that the promo copy line reads that big money can bring big problems and big threats. And it's yes. like the setup. It's like, okay, you got this big money, but look, you're going to have these big problems later on, big threats. That was just such a great pull about what this book is going to be all about. Do you feel like that one like exactly says what we're talking about here? Yeah, totally. And and I really wanted to write a book which had money as a, as a motive or, or, or probable motive right from the outset. And actually, I started thinking about um, pyramid schemes, not not like big Bernie Madoff schemes, but the, sm the kind of smaller ones that infiltrate neighborhoods and involve family members and neighbors and friends on a, on a smaller scale, because um, I'd seen a documentary on TV and been absolutely um, appalled by how they can kind of rip people apart when it goes wrong. Um, and I tried to make a book work around that, but it was hard because it would have needed a massive cast of characters. So I was actually talking to my agent one day and she said, why don't you have somebody win the lottery? And I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole thing fell into place. And I already had Tom and Nicole. So I, I gave them a big lottery win and started the book again. And then it was so much fun to write. But I do think money changes us all. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. Lack of it or too much of it. Yeah. So I have to ask, if you had a major lottery win, what would be the first thing that you'd buy? What would you do? Uh, I would probably upgrade my real estate. <laughs> Just <laughs> like they did. <laughs> That'd be the first thing to do. I would buy a second home in the mountains of Colorado. I'd keep my yeah, house. I like nice. my house. Second house. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Second house. Nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. 
So let's start with the house, the glass house. Do you love architecture and homes? Because the way you went in and described this glass home and not only the features in it, but just like the ambiance around it or whatever, do you love like uh, thinking about homes, home decor, things like that? I do. I absolutely love it. I'm the first person in front of the television when you have grand design. Do you have grand designs over there? We have a show called Grand Designs, which always shows a couple building a home from scratch and it follows them for however long that takes. And it's absolutely gripping. It always goes wrong, always goes over budget, but the the homes they build are amazing. Um, So I love new architecture and I also love old architecture. So this juxtaposition of this brand new spanking new glass home with all these smart features I spent a lot of time reading about Bill Gates's house and what that house can do to inspire me for the smart features and then I was so much fun to put it next door to this really old English manor house which has been settled into this landscape for hundreds of years what I also love is tech works until it doesn't and tech is actually the threat that all thriller writers are up against right now because you can do everything. You can figure everything out. But what you have here is it doesn't work. All of a sudden, when the music is not following you, when the doors are not opening, when things are not locking, when I love this, when you get a guest that comes to the house, they have a pin so they can roam around the house and you know where everyone is. But when that doesn't work, and I think you showed the other side of tech, like it's not just When you go to shoot the gun and there are no bullets left, you've taken it to the tech side like that. Yeah, and that was a lot of fun because like you say, tech makes it really hard for us when we're writing to disguise murders and motives. Um, But then if you just say, well, maybe if it doesn't work, you've solved a lot of problems. (laughs) But I I wanted these houses to really act like characters in themselves and, and the tech and the smart home really really helps with that. Um, And I also think, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I think a lot of us struggle with tech, that things are over-specced. I preferred my car when it wasn't a computer, you know? I have a much older car and everybody goes, why don't you like upgrade? And I'm like, okay, this one's got a CD player in it. Call me crazy, (laughs) but sometimes that's all I want. I listen to Sirius XM radio, but sometimes I just want to click and know it's going to play. And it doesn't have a lot of features on it that I had to learn because I feel like sometimes if you get into my husband's car, like for example, I'm driving a spaceship, there's no key. I press buttons. I do that. And there are times I sit there and say, I don't think I can drive your car. And he looks at me like I'm crazy. And I was like, I am just not into this. I'm not into thinking that hard. Whereas like, I know the kind of car I'd like right now, but to get to that car, I have to do all the buttons and I'm not into it. Which people find is really funny because I'm into a lot of tech, but not in the car. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm with you on that. I think things can be overspecked by by miles. Oh yeah, and it's like then the kind of basic things. I'm like, well, what if you're in the mountains and there's no like radio and you can't get Spotify? What do you do? I I just yeah. plug in in a yeah. Well, I'm old fashioned. What can I say? <laughs> so then tell us about this couple, Sasha and Ollie, who live just up the lane in the manor house with their housekeeper Kitty. And they prove to be very interesting neighbors. They are interesting neighbors. They're they're also another young couple. And and at first it's very nice when Tom and Nicole move in to think, oh, you know, there's another couple close to our age in the manor house. But they don't quite get along right from the start. They kind of rub along. Um, There's no disagreement, but they're not the same kind of people. So Sasha is a yoga teacher. She's pretty chill. Um, Kitty works for them. She has a little home in a coach house, the old coach house on site. And Ollie, Ollie's an interesting one because he's a writer and I had a lot of fun with him. He's an unpublished writer who is very, very sure that he's the next big thing. And that was terrific fun to write. And Ollie's writing and writing and writing, but there doesn't seem to be anything produced by Ollie writing, writing, and writing. He never has a manuscript that says, hey, what do you think of this? Nothing. He just goes off by himself and must have quiet. I love that too, you know? He must have quiet. He must have the best room in the house to write in. He must be the Lord of the Manor. um, And he must have respect for what he's doing, even though he doesn't produce. (laughs) He's not terribly nice. <laughs> no, he's not, not, not. And then they have this housekeeper, Kitty, who is at their beck and call. Kitty does this, Kitty does that. So she's another, okay, where did this person come from? You know. I think the thing about Kitty, there's a lot of, the, there's, there are people who work in these roles where they get very stuck because the roles come with accommodation. 
um, there's a lot of sort of grace and favor um, little cottages and things that you can live in that makes it very hard for people to move on their whole world gets consumed by the place that they live in and I think Kitty is a bit like that it's very difficult for her to move on yeah I'm not going to leave here I, I will be fine by here but I'm not going to leave here it's not going to be good for me so mm -hmm. the book takes place over a week and then we drop into five years before and the day of his death. So we've got these three different time scenarios going. And the time of death for Tom is like hour, like this hour, this hour, what happened? What do you like about writing within a time constraint like that when things are happening within a week? Like, do you plot out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Uh, I don't plot um, really. Uh, but I do love a time constraint because I think you can get really immediate with your characters and really into their heads in the moment by moment kind of uncertainties and twists and turns that any investigation will take and I love it as a way of building tension so I didn't put Tom Tom does appear later in the book and we follow him hour by hour through that morning and I didn't think of that till I'd almost finished it so I suddenly went because I love um Chronicle of a Death Foretold by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, that yeah. little novella. Yes. And I thought, oh, why don't I do a, a fun little homage to that? And it wouldn't it be amazing to see what's actually happening to Tom? Because we don't know yet, but we could start to watch it. And then I, it caused me to have to do a massive rewrite. But I'm so glad I did. I started to really love the book then because I love Tom. Yeah. And what he's doing all day long is like everyday things and something happens and it's an everyday thing and it changes the whole trajectory of the book and you're not yeah. realizing this till later. So it's, yeah, really between the five years before the day of his death and what's happening day by day, I feel like we're moving in time, but we're really seeing what happened five years before. How did it get us to this day? And it's not just the win of the lottery. There's other things that are coming into play here that are very, very big to think about. Yes, the five years before sections of somebody's diary. And that it gives a little bit of history on the landscape and the houses and what's been going on. And that is important in terms of, of the outcome of the novel. So that was fun to play with too. Yeah, and you're saying going, aha, uh -huh, I think I have another clue. Okay, now I think I have it. You don't have it. You don't even have it till the very end. I mean, it's... And the five years before allowed you more of a setup. That's what I feel like as, if, you know, if I'm right, because then you can place the characters, but you don't have to place them as they're having a cup of coffee today. They're walking up the lane. They're doing this. It's, you can just write a story about them that's contingent to what's going on later, but it's a story. You're just a little bit more free in that five years before. Yeah, that's a very good point. I didn't think of that actually, but I but I know as I was writing, I felt that freedom and it was nice. You you could feed in information about characters you're meeting in the present day without being laborious about that. In well, hopefully not in the in the kind of line of the story it's happening in the moment. So yeah, that was fun. You're right. It was a setup. I did I probably didn't think of it like that, but it definitely is. Yeah, and you're allowed to get a lot more free with your characters. You're allowed to, like, why do they do this? Why do you do that? You can understand it a lot better later on. You know, you also write from various points of view. And what do you like about that? Like, do you sit down and say in a day, today, this is who I'm going to write in the voice of, and tomorrow I'm going to do this, and tomorrow, or does it all just where I'm getting ideas and blending them together? Uh, I'll probably sit down every morning and go, right, I'm writing so-and-so section today, or I think this section, this bit of information is best delivered through this scene, through this mm -hmm. character's head. Mm -hmm. And I love it because it means the reader can know something before the characters. Mm -hmm. And so you can add that extra layer of fun for the reader. To, it's almost like when you're watching a, a play and you want to scream, don't do it, because you can <laughs> see somebody behind somebody, you know, with a knife. It's that kind of, you know, reader knowledge. Um I mean, I can flip backwards and forwards in a day. I don't need to be rigidly stuck, but often, you know, that's the kind of thing you really tidy up in an edit as well. You go, oh, I kind of used that character's voice for that, you know, and you sort of really look at everybody, make sure that they're consistent and sounding like themselves and, and yeah. all of that. So, yeah. You re read all the Sasha chapters and see if she, you know, deviates. Well, Sasha, as far as I'm concerned, is always walking around with a yoga mat. <laughs> she always yeah. has, yeah, okay. She's got the yoga mat. She's setting up for yoga. Class is happening for yoga. Yeah. It's being suggested that Nicole take yoga. I mean, yoga is very involved. So do you practice yoga? I have, have done. 
<laughs> I have a really close friend who's a yoga teacher. So I have been to her. I won't go to anyone else because I feel very loyal and I am a bad student. I haven't been for a long, long time. <laughs> I've got to be honest. You know, I used to go six days a week before the pandemic. Oh, wow. Working in New York, they had these really nice late evening classes that started like eight and we go to 915. And that's perfect because I come yeah. home, eat dinner and then go. And now they have these classes that are not working for me. And a couple of the um, the practitioners are not there anymore that I really liked. And it's changed the whole vibe for me. And I also tried yoga at home. And I was in my bedroom with the Zoom set up. I was all like, it's on the TV, all ready to go. This is me doing yoga. Oh, the bed needs to get made. Yes. I get up, I'm making the bed. <laughs> I'm cleaning the room and all of a sudden everyone is in Shavasana and I haven't done a thing. Like I have done nothing. Like, and then I, I'm hoping that the camera is off, that this poor woman who I love, Rena, is not seeing that I'm cleaning the room and I'm not paying one bit of attention, you know? But the good thing about doing it remotely is if you can't get your leg where they're telling you to put it or you can't balance it's okay because no one sees you. So it's true. It's true. I, I, I'm always thinking it was when Sasha was walking around with her yoga stuff. I was like, mm, yeah, here we go. You know, and you have to have the right things. Like you show up. Like the first time I went, I went with my son's then girlfriend, right? And she was practicing. She was, oh, I'll go with you. It was like this month trial thing I was on, right? So we go and I'm following her moves and she's telling me what to do. Forget the teacher. She's telling me what to do. And at during Shavasana, she falls asleep. And I'm just thinking, like, <laughs> oh my gosh, now I don't know what to do. Do I wake her up? So it was my, my my beginning of yoga was like doomed from the start, you know, just doomed. It was, I don't know, put your blocks in the right place, the whole thing. But I did enjoy it. I really did. And I'd love to get back to it. But it's somehow just being home here doesn't have that same thing of, oh, just drive no. down to take a class. I yeah. can't take the 1115 class even though I own the company, that's wrong. I should take it after work. You know, it's ridiculous. The I'm the same. Finding time for it is the, is the struggle. And I'm lazy in the evenings. I don't, I don't, I won't go out if it's dark and freezing. No, it was, <laughs> it was fun, but no. But I love that Nicole studied how to dress and decorate for when they live their new life. As you said, she felt pressure to live up to the win, to be good at being rich. And I feel like this line, this one line said so much about her that she's practicing for the role of being rich and she must succeed at it. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, she knows what she's got. She is, she listens to the person who comes to your house and advises you what to do with the money. She Googles the stories about all the people who blow it all and lose their friends and family. And believe me, there are a ton of stories like that on the internet. If you, if you want to go yeah. down that rabbit hole. Um, yeah. She, she studies it. She understands what's happened. She understands the value of this to her life and to Tom's. And she even infects him with it a bit. Like he thinks he should get into opera because they're fancy now you know they're rich <laughs> so it's a thing they do and she doesn't want to be she doesn't want anyone to make fun of her she doesn't want to be seen to be nouveau riche and to get things wrong she's desperately trying to fit in I just found that so interesting because I had never thought of somebody practicing to be wealthy like practicing of what should I do what faux pas would I create that they'd say at the store ah. Oh, and she won all that money and she bought chicken on sale. Like just yeah. something that she just wouldn't yeah. want to do that yeah. you would be presumed if someone says donate, she did not donate enough. I just felt like she was in this moment of what should I do next? You know, I think there are a lot of pitfalls to getting a lot of money suddenly. Yeah, no, I think there judgment. are. I think that, you know, if, if people come into money suddenly, it's like, what should you do? Some blow it. Some sit yeah. there and feel they need to help everybody, which Tom definitely did feel within the book that he should be doing yes. with his old friend, Patrick. And then when you give, how much is enough? When is it yeah. enough? When is it too much? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So like when they get together for Christmas, are they supposed to buy these opulent presents for people? What are they yeah. supposed to do? How are they yeah. supposed to show up? And I think that rapid money is a very interesting thing to watch what people do. Like, quick money. And it's like internet guys make a lot of money. What do you do? You buy a boat. <laughs> yeah, you buy I a know, boat. Right? <laughs> yeah. You buy a boat, you buy a mansion, you just start hanging out with other people who are as rich as you. That seems to be the safe move. Yeah. And you have a mansion in every city that you go to so mm -hmm. that you never have to stay. And if you really look at these lifestyles, it's so crazy. And then your security and then all these other things that come with it. 
And you're just there like, this is such an unnatural way to live. It's, it's kind of mind boggling, you know? Yeah. And I always think about even those people, they still have to hire regular people as their staff. It's not like they can escape the regular world. You're still going to have a lot of the issues you'd have if you were recruiting for any business, you know, you can't, you can't completely isolate yourself from everything. Right. And think about it. If you're in your home, what's the thing you really don't have to worry about is anybody else. You have a okay, yeah. cleaning person that comes in, but you don't have round the clock people making your meals, maybe not making the things the way you want. And then you have to go tell them. So it's like running a company at your house is what I felt yes. like. Yeah. I would hate that. I would not like that. No. And I feel like Nicole is still trying to do it on her own. She's not she bringing is. in a lot of people. They brought in people to help them build the house, but she doesn't have a lot of help right now, helping her around the house. She's no, doing no, no. it all. She's doing it all. And they felt they felt a bit intimidated by their architect and by the guy who came to tell them how to have a wine cellar and all the rest of it. They felt a bit looked down on. And, and she's also proud. You know, her mom and her grandma, they swept their front steps. They mm-hmm. they cleaned their own houses. And Nicole very much has that about her. She's she's proud. She's yeah. as proud. Well, there's something that really happens back at the beginning with the yoga, with the with the win. I'm sorry, not the yoga, the win of the lottery ticket. There's something way up front that happens that just makes you say, who's Nicole? Like, what's she really like? And yeah. you, I did that actually on a reread. I actually saw that even more because there's this one flash moment and you just sit there and say, who is this woman? And what ends up happening with her as a result of this one tiny thing she does it becomes a big deal. Yeah. So, I don't know. I also did love the tech though. Because the tech is supposed to help us find out who killed Tom. It's supposed to help us find out, you know, where this broken tech goes back into like, you know, earlier time. And we have to do all the detective work with you of what happened. And when we find out what happened to Tom, it's like more simplistic than anybody thought of what was going to happen. It was just there. And I think that's, that's often, you know, tech and stuff often can, can kind of fudge that, can't it? You think, oh, this must, you know, blah, 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 you know, tech must have, but 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 often murder or death come as a result of very small things, grievances, accidents, moments that go wrong, you know, things where life turns on a dime. So, you know, it's often a little bit normal. Yeah. Even yeah. And, then, and then there's the sheep. There's a sheep. They're not a multiple sheep, just one sheep, one sheep. And the one sheep is going to play a very big role in the book. And... <laughs> I'm not going to tell you anymore, but the sheep <laughs> honestly needs the, the a pin. Sh- the sheep needs a pin on it so it can be found. And, <laughs> and I feel that just the act of this oversized sheep being such much of a part of the story, just it makes you go back and have a little chuckle later on because they're on this all this land and they're not going to have multiple sheep they're going to have the one sheep and the one the sheep one, is going to be the one fiberglass sheep. sheep yeah so that was inspired by a holiday we went on to italy a long time ago with my family and they had one fiberglass sheep <laughs> and so we got in the habit of of moving the thing just to give people so it'd be having breakfast if you came down in the morning or you'd find it in your sunny in your bedroom when you woke up or <laughs> by the pool on a sunbed and so I, I I don't know why but I thought of the sheep when I was thinking about this book and I thought you know that's the kind of thing Nicole would like <laughs> it's just so perfect you know years ago they had this thing where people would um sponsor horses these these mm, yeah these, these horses these wooden horses and they decorate them and then they'd sell them at the end. And I remember saying to my husband, let's buy one of the horses. It's just like so cool. And he's like, just think about where the horse is on the front lawn of the library and think of it on our front lawn. <laughs> a totally different vibe. And that's what I was thinking of with the sheep. And I had picked out the horse that I really liked and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, well, where will I put this? Like on the back lawn where no one will see it? Like, will people drive by our house to see this? So it's just such a funny thing for him to have bought her when I was thinking back on the horses. Like, are they going to decorate the sheep for each holiday? Like, what are they going to do with this thing? I love that. I love the personal nature of that, that little thing between them, you know? It's like, oh yeah, this is what we're going to do with this, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, this is... Yeah, if all the money that we've got and all that we've got going on, let's just get the sheep in this old yeah. fiber best sheep. Because that's really what she wants the most. Not diamonds, not anything else, the no. sheep, you know? Sheep. It was really, really funny. So was the title always the manor house? Was that always what you 
played around with? No. Uh, so the title in the UK is different for this book. In the oh. UK, it's called The Fall. Um, and it got changed for the US market. I think um, The Fall wasn't working for them. And I think because my book, The Nanny, did very nicely, um, they thought the manor house was kind of slightly linked to that world of sort of Englishness. Um, and I'm really pleased with it. I like the cover. I think it's a good package, actually. Yeah, the, the sharp edges on the edge of it or whatever. Be careful what you wish for was the tagline. And we presented this book in a couple of previews over the summer. And I just said, just think of this. You win all this money and be careful what you wish for, because yeah. it's not going to go the way you planned, you know? And B.A. Paris said storytelling at its best. And it's really good. I mean, they're great blurbs about you on the back. I mean, it's just really wonderful the way you put this together. Um, so the cover, it's all, was this the first one you saw? Uh, yes, there was that. And there was a different colored version of it. And we ummed and ah between the two, actually. There's one that was, it wasn't quite aqua. It was more greeny. Um, but I like this. I know the book's set in summer, but I like the, the sort of mistiness of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it completely works. The way the fence is not like complete in places. I loved it. So there's an yeah. ensemble cast for the audiobook which is really yeah. interesting. Now, was that recorded in the UK and the US is using it or what's the what's the draw I on that? I believe so. I think that was all organized through the UK publisher. I haven't listened because I can't bear to listen to my own <laughs> book. So I hope it's good. Um, I'm sure I'll find out, but yeah. <laughs> it, it's a really big ensemble cast. And I love how those things come together because it's sometimes when you're reading or you're listening, you're not sure what time frame of what's going on. A number yes. of people have said they can't figure out what time period they're in or who the person is. It's hard when you jump, when you're uh, listening. And it's hard sometimes even on an ebook, people tell me, because they can't figure out, oh, wait, this is this, the, you know, like who's the yeah. character, et cetera. Yeah. So I think the ensemble sounds really interesting. So that was them conceiving of it and figuring out what to go on. Yeah, and they send you um, kind of choices of different voices for the parts, which is really fun. So you get a little bit of input there, depending on who's available. Yeah, you had one, two, three, four, five, six. I think there's seven people, seven people in the cast, which is huge. Wow. Really? Yes. So maybe if you listen to it, it'll be a different book for you because it'll be their voices, not yours. No. <laughs> not happening, Carol. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> <doing> <laughs> it, no. <laughs> you know, I'm so stuck on talking more about this book because it seems like, oh, even the ending people is like brilliant. Don't read the last couple of pages. Don't do that in advance because there's so many little blips here that I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha you again. I got gotcha you again. And I think that that was really the fun of reading the book, but the way it's been so hard to talk to you about the book because we can't give anything away. If we give, if we give anything away, we're in trouble. And it's just yeah, not, you know, it's like Jenga, spoil. isn't it? If, if we pull out one of the part, you know, the bricks, the whole thing comes down. <laughs> yeah. So the only thing we can talk about is like, you know, pretending to be rich, working at being rich, the house and somebody's dead. And how did they get, how did they, I love this, get dead. And then other people die. And how did they get dead too? So that's and then the sheep. Like, and then the sheep. <laughs> so let's see, we got a line about this book. You know, we got rich people that got rich fast. We got neighbors that are a little bit jealous. We got a guy who doesn't really write, but says he's a writer. We got a woman who does a lot of yoga. We've got a woman who is a housekeeper, but really what's going on with her and who is she? And we've got the sheep. So it's, and the dead guy in the pool guys is on page five. So you don't have to work hard to get to that. That's not a, you know, he's dead, but we do get to meet him later on, which makes it even more fun. I don't know. I think it's a great pitch. Now, what do you, do you have something you're working on now? Uh, yes, I'm working on something just a tiny bit different. Still a thriller. Um, I'm not saying any more about it, um, but I'm excited and uh, talking to my agent about it. So uh, more soon. Watch early this stages. Early stages. Yeah. Are you, yeah. you know, when you're in early stages, do you write a plot and then do some chapters? What do you like when you say you're in early stages? Is it just you're just I mean, I know you don't plot in advance, but you just plot it like, you know, saying this is what the story is going to be. So this one, I've been actually work, spent more time setting up than I normally do. I normally do a book a year and I have not done a book last year. So I will not have one out next year. It'll be a 2025 book, all being well. Um, it it's a, it's, I haven't plotted it. I usually start with an idea and a character and I work really hard to get the voice right. Okay. And um, then, and then I've, I've just wanted to spend a bit of time with it because it's a bit more complex. It's a lot of fun. 
um, and it's not quite as domestic as my previous thrillers. So mm. that's all I'm saying. So I've kind of done research. I've plotted it a little bit. I've worked rewriting and rewriting the beginning and the characters just to make it very, very strong. I hope. <laughs> that's right. That's great. You know, 2024 is going to be a tough year. We've got um, the election in this here in the States, which means we have two conventions. And I realized yesterday, I have not written this into my notes, is the Olympics. And the Olympics oh, yeah. will distract people for two weeks. I mean, we're, people are going to be watching some on bios. People will be watching certain events. Not everyone will watch, but people will watch. And so we've got three big things all happening over the summer preceding the election in November. So there's going to be a lot of air sucked out of the room and coming yeah. into next year. So I haven't thought to that, but yeah, that's, that's a good, good point in the U S in the U S now. You're, okay. So this, when did the manor house or the, whatever the title was come out in the UK, it came out much soon, much earlier it came out uh, in, I think it was April or May as a hardback and it's getting its paperback release in 2024. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I'm because, kind of between. Yeah. Between versions. what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been a funny long release. Normally I have the book has the same title and it comes out more or less at the same time. So this has been quite a drawn out process for me. Yeah. It, and it's, well, it's nice though, because you have two different stages of promotion instead of yes. having to do UK right on top of the United States. And it's also interesting that you have the UK, see what the questions are that people ask, see what you know was resonating. You can read reviews and see what people are taking away from the book and as what you expected them to take away. I always think as an author, that's gotta be interesting of what you thought they would see and what they actually did see. Oh, it's yeah, it totally. Is. And sometimes you'll sit with people and uh, they'll say, <laughs> oh gosh, you know, I, I saw this extraordinary theme emerging in your book. Um, this is, and then you think, did you? <laughs> well, <laughs> good, but I, I wish I could say I planned it. So, so that's always an interesting one. You can always say, I was working towards that. I'm so glad you saw it. I was working towards that. Yeah, yeah. I should say that. At, I? at what I'm point did you enough. notice it first? At what point did you notice it second? <laughs> Educate me on okay. when you saw it, because I know where I planted it. Probably in about. You know, I had a, an I had an interesting thing happen. Um, I just did a little tour in Canada, and I did a couple of U.S. dates. But I was in in Canada a couple of weeks ago for this book, and I we we did a I did an a, Linwood and I were interviewing each other, and we were signing at the end. And one of the audience came up to me, and she waited to the end, and leaned over and said, "I won the lottery." Oh wow! Oh wow! Yeah, they don't think anybody else to know. I and then said, I don't think it changed me. And I said, I thought, oh, I wonder. <laughs> oh, I wonder. I would really I would have loved that though at the end. And then you're there like, oh, who can I tell that you won? <laughs> I know. Exactly. You know, well, I like, she won the lottery. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, everybody. Yeah. It was very much not to be spread around. Yeah. <laughs> you're sitting there like, why is this woman hovering towards the end? What is this? Yeah. I mean, Honestly, I think that there could be a mystery written, a grid thriller about a book tour and the thing yes. on the book tour, you know, <laughs> the surprise moments. And the other one I really love is, and I saw an interview yesterday with Janet Ivanovich, where she says people come up to her and tell her things that were in the books and she's completely forgotten them. And she goes, right, <laughs> because yeah. you just don't remember every character as, as somebody who just finished the book is going to remember it, especially oh, you before. Yes. I was once on um, live radio and somebody said to me, oh, so um, I want to talk to you about Richard. And this was, I think it was The Perfect Girl. It's one of my early books. And of course, it had been a year since I wrote it. And I thought, I simply don't know who you mean. I don't <laughs> know. And luckily, he then said something that triggered um, my memory. But there was a moment where I thought, I'm going to have to say something super bland or actually, because I can't ask. It's was like live radio. You could just go, well, what did you think about Richard? <laughs> <laughs> I would have, yeah. <laughs> what did you think about him? I had such strong thoughts about him. What are yours? Yeah. You know? yeah. That's the one I thought too. You know? yeah. I remember one time I was on one of those really early morning television shows. I used to do this five to seven spot, five in the morning, the seven spot. Oh, wow. CBS. And they were talking about Harry Potter. And I have now breezed through the entire interview. And at the end, they go, and how much does this book cost? <laughs> I had no idea how much the book cost. And I sat there, I go, I really have no idea. But I knew it was a higher number than had been before. And I'd read yeah. that, but I never remembered what the number, I go, $29.95, like I really. And that moment oh. where you're on camera where you're just going, could you just stop that? Oh no, this is live. 
You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Were you right? Was it 29.99? I don't even remember. I was so mortified. <laughs> I wanted to leave. I just was like, I was like, hey, no one's more scholastic. See that I did not know the price of the book, but I've done oh. like, all these other things about children being really interested. Blah blah blah. I thought all my parts were really good, and then they asked the hardline question. You know, the one that no, I want to say the book is going to be on my desk in an hour. It's not like I'm going to the store. But there was yeah, I said that too. We went to the final Harry Potter event, and it was over at. Um, we went to the borders that was up at Columbus Circle by our office. Right. Good friend Ann Binkley was organizing the event and had my sons come with me, right? So my yeah. sons are at the front of the line. So they are among the first children in the United States to get a copy of the book. So that's cool. Come out, the media is lined up MTV, Fox News, ABC, CBS, uh -huh. everybody along the line, right? And they're stopping my children to do this. So I'm like, oh my God. So I grab the pull over and go, this is going to be a sound bite. I want you to work on what you're going to say. Let's like, just do this. So they're going down the line. And at the end, they finish. And Corey, my younger son is very shy, but he really like did this. And he turns around and he goes, is there any more media? Any more media for us to do? And I just burst out laughing. <laughs> he was ready. <laughs> Because I really, I just pulled them aside. And I go, okay, here's a couple of things you can say because I'm like, what are they going to say on camera? So this thing starts playing on, I don't know whether it's an MTV or something like that. And all these parents are calling me and they're going, the boys were so good because the boys were replaying like every hour and a half. They like loop them back in. And I was, I, I don't even think I have a tape of it, but it was just so funny that like, okay, here's what we're going to do. So we've been on- That was good coaching. Very good coaching from mom. Yeah, it's like- <laughs> It's called a soundbite. Just go really quick on what you feel. Yeah. This is what they're probably going to ask. Answer this question. So then we walked across the street because somebody needed something to drink at the um, drugstore or something. And all the books are stacked up there. And Corey goes, whoa, we could have gone over here and just gotten the book. And I said, yes, but you wouldn't have done media. <laughs> now you did like, media. media. But I love it. And the price is this, just in case they ask you, you know, but... <laughs> It was just so funny because you realize those on the spot kinds of a questions, like, how do you answer? What do you say? And it's very hard. It's very hard, especially yeah. when it's, it, it's also in this book, they may start to talk about something that you don't want to go down that road yeah. and reveal. So you have to do this pullback kind of a thing. So yeah, you do. I offer, I always find as well, I struggle in my first event because I'm not oiled, you know, I don't know what, how to talk about the book yet. So by the time, I've been talking for a few weeks. It's very straightforward and you know what people are interested in. But those first few events, I always think, oh, should, you know, it's very, you know, it's difficult at first. Well, I also try to bring up a question that everybody might not have been asked. And yeah. I'm always looking for that, that it's going to bring something different. And I love it when authors sit there and say, I hadn't thought about that at all. Like I hadn't thought about you that. You know what you brought up that. today that what no one that? else did? The sheep. That? The sheep. No one about the sheep. Oh my God. No one talked about the sheep. <laughs> it's so funny, but it's like one of those things that just came to mind to me at this large thing, you know? I think it was because of the horses on my front lawn, you know? And it's like I'm very happy to talk about the sheep. Yeah. And it's so like it's it's just this thing that somebody would go out and say, I'm gonna go buy this because this would really make them happy. And it's just the funniest thing going, you know. And it, it adds a little lightness to the book because everything else is like, what's really happening? Who can you trust? You don't feel like you can trust anybody. And you don't feel like you can trust Nicole right from the start from what she does. And you always have this little niggle in the back of your head of like, well, what's she really do? Like, okay, he's dead in the pool. Like, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She can't yeah. operate everything, but what, what happened with that? And there's yeah. a and I, that's a fun thing to play with always in books. And I, my debut was a bit like that. The mother, you know, she loses a child, but the police turn on her. They're kind of like, at first it's, who is it? And then it's like, is it you? And you never quite know as you're reading it. And that's always a fun thing. Yeah. I was like, oh, did you actually do this? Are you actually the person? And because yeah. they're going to look at the spouse, right? Of course they are. Yeah. They're going to look at the spouse. And then you also got the detectives always who are always like lamely walking along and everybody on the property knows more. And then every once in a while you get a smart detective that asks some question, but they're, tra you're, they're usually always traipsing through the woods trying to find somebody yeah. when the person that you need is like sitting in the living room. You know, it's yeah. like, 
<laughs> I think we're I think we're pursuing the suspect. And I'm like, hmm, on the couch. Mm, maybe, you know? <laughs> maybe what is the line? All is not what it seems. Like that's the best yes, thing. Right. All, all, I think every thriller should just let them, it's all is not what it seems. Book number five thousand, yeah. you know. Yeah, <laughs> generic tagline. <laughs> No, so I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed uh, the, the, the flipping around of people, what happened right up to the last page. So once again, once again, another bets on for you. So, so, so enjoyed Thank it. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. And if you go further than uh, the piece of land and the characters, I'll be happy to travel with you. So feel free to go big. Feel free to go okay. big in 2025, you know? Well, I'm coming to you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much for joining us. It was so much fun to see you again. Thank you very much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. And to our readers and listeners, uh, you can find us on the Book Report Network, where you can find our Book Reporter Talks to interviews there, as well as a lot of other things that we've done. And you can also find us uh, wherever you listen to podcasts as Book Reporter Talks to. Thanks so much for joining us today. <laughs>